thank you all for taking the time out of your busy schedules to come to be with us here today, those of you who are here in the room and those who are around the country and listening to this. Um, and it is my great pleasure uh, to talk about the HPV vaccine and particularly why we're bringing in changes in the vaccination program. And no one's allowed to fall asleep. I know you've all had a nice lunch and you're comfortable near your chairs, but really this is an incredible story and incredible benefits. And um, we really need to know the background to it. Um, just some disclosures. Uh, some of you watched the video. Kevin has spoken eloquently about the impact of cervical cancer. 300 women every year develop cervical cancer. 90 women die. 90% can be prevented. And you've heard about Laura, uh, a most amazing person that those of us got to, to, who got to know her just a little um, and the effort she put in and how she was the person to say she was born too late for this benefit. And we need to make sure that there aren't people who are born in time to get the benefit who don't get it. And you may ask, well, why, if I'm talking about HPV for boys, do I start off by talking about a girl, even though it's a remarkable girl? Well, the first thing is, no man is an island, and Laura's outcome devastated many men in her family. Um, and affected her brothers, her family, and friends. But, you know, we're all different, and really what we're aiming to do with HPV is not just protect a small segment of the community who get the vaccine. What we're aiming to do is provide equity of access of, for all and to maximize protection for all, boys and girls alike, everybody because this virus actually doesn't discriminate, and we'll go through some of that. So I will start with cervical cancer, because that's where it started. And it is um, quite amazing on a global scale to see the impact of this with um, over 300,000 uh, new cases uh, last year, uh, sorry, 300,000 deaths last year, and 500, almost 600,000 cases. And in Europe, uh, 25,000 to over 25,000 deaths. And when you think about the number of families that that impacts on, it is really quite remarkable. And you've heard mention of this from our minister today, uh, where the WHO has listed it on one of the th 10 big challenges affecting us all this year and has called for cervical cancer elimination um, and the use of HPV vaccination to do that. Now, I'll gloss over this because you know what, there are a number of vaccines. Uh, there is a bivalent vaccine, quadrivalent vaccine, which is the one that's been in use in Ireland. And uh, we are now moving to the nine-valent vaccine. It was introduced first by, um, recommended by WHO in 2009 for all girls at 12 to 13 years of age. And why? Because it's most immunogenic and the immunogenicity is better in the younger girls. And if you vaccinate young, you only need two doses. If you're over 15, then you need to get three doses. HPV4 protects against 70% of cervical cancers and precancers, but we want to extend that because there are other serotypes that are high risk uh, for cancer. Oh, this slipped a bit. Um, Australia, and I'm sorry that that slipped, I checked it before. Um, in Australia, they have almost the longest uh, record of experience with, this, uh, with these vaccines. And um, as you look, that was supposed to incorporate the 6 and 11. And looking at the drops or the declines from the pre-vaccine population prevalence to the vaccinated from 5.5 to 0.2%, and a drop also in the unvaccinated population. And what we're beginning to see here is evidence of breaking the chain of transmission and herd immunity. When we get on to these higher risk cancer types, these are the ones that cause genital warts. When we get on to the higher risk cancer types, these are really the ones we're very interested in, in terms of preventing death and disease. But look at the magnitude of the drop. 21% population prevalence to 1.5% in the vaccinated. 
and a benefit in terms of those who are not vaccinated as well. Um, no, this is good. All of that's a bit out of sync. But there are other, if we just focus on the stars then, there are a number of other uh, high-risk types that aren't incorporated in the four valence strain. And it was for that reason uh, that we are moving to uh, the nine valent vaccine. It still won't catch all of the high-risk types, but it will increase the protection from 70% to 90%. And uh, this is just graphically showing the declines in the early vaccinated cohort, uh, very good drops. These were the later, the catch-up a bit slower, but importantly, in the older age groups, there was really no significant change. And importantly, we didn't see any increase with the non-vaccine serotypes. So overall, there was a reduction in HPV prevalence. There was a reduction in high-grade cervical abnormalities. It almost eliminated genital warts. And uh, this is something people don't talk about much, but this is juvenile onset res uh, recurrent respiratory res papillomatosis. Sorry. That's where a child is born to a mother who's infected with the virus, and it gets onto their laryngeal cords, and it's quite troublesome with warts and interfering with um, uh, speech and speech volume. And the story is the same, no matter where you look. I mean, one of the things about this is the data that's come out from across the globe from originally the original trials, but also from the later effectiveness trials in the real world, has been the incredible impact. This is in the USA, looking at the reduction pre-vaccine, post-vaccine in the vaccine types. So um, absolutely dramatic um, changes uh, across. In Tennessee, and this was the impact on anal genital wart uh, incidence, and again, in the vaccinated groups, both in females and a little bit of reduction in the males showing some herd benefit. And again, this is moving on now. So the, these ones so far have been dealing with infection rates, but now we're moving on to deal with the consequences of infection and seeing actually reductions in the number of cases of high-grade cervical lesions in these types as well, in the vaccinated, and not in the ones that weren't covered by the vaccine. And in cytology, again, compared with vaccinated women, compared with the unvaccinated women born in 1998, um, this was in Scotland, so nearer to home, showed dramatic reductions in CIN3 or worse. So this is really up into your pre-invasive, pre-cancer state and showing the uh, reductions in not so much change between the vaccinated and unvaccinated in these lower ones, but when we get into these higher grades, marked reduction in the vaccinated, sort of a catch up in the others and here right down. So dramatic changes seen there. So routine immunization of girls 12 to 13 years and they were using the bivalent vaccine, led to a dramatic reduction in pre-invasive cervical disease. And again, um, in this Danish study, um, and I just highlighted that Danish study, to be honest, trying to pick out what bits of information to sh show you uh, was difficult because all of the studies are consistent across the globe. All of them show reduction in HPV infection. Now, as countries are using it for longer, we're seeing reduction in pre-cancers, and actually, also for the first time from Finland, reduction in actually cervical cancer. But what was interesting there, sorry as you go back, was that um, we were able, as you know, to go from three doses to a two-dose schedule, and it looks like for those who are vaccinated very young, like between 12 and 13, a one-dose schedule may be adequate in the future. Does it work? Absolutely. And this is Costa Rica, again, showing the marked reduction. So right across the globe, this is, oops, sorry. Right across the globe, um, reductions in, in um, vaccine type infection, genital warts, CIN, and in cancer. And 
We've heard about waning immunity, and yes, we have to wait and see ultimately. That's a concern across many vaccines, but the durability of response seems very good against these high-risk types. These are just looking at the two different brands of vaccine, but down here is what you might get after natural infection. So very good vaccines. But what about the boys? Well, by extending the program to boys, we will increase herd protection, and that's very well and good. That will lead to further reductions in cervical cancer, and I'll come back to that. But there is also an issue about protecting men for their own sake, not just protecting them for the other members in the family. Um, we've heard about uh, HPV vaccine here and how our rates fell. And when they were at the lowest, that meant in each cohort there were 15,000 girls who were not vaccinated. Now, you know from the measles story, we're still feeling the impact of the drop-off in the people who missed out on vaccinations. So there is a vulnerable cohort, and we can assume that not all of those are going to catch up on their vaccines. It has gone up, thanks to the information campaign, but even at our best, we're now only at 70%. So we still have 30% of each birth cohort coming through unvaccinated. Now this is um, some slides, and in sake of disclosure, I grabbed from an MSD presentation at the European Pediatric Conferences this year and adapted it a bit, but it really showed what it's about. There have been some modeling exercises that show that if we are using those vaccines for up to 70 years, if uptake is low, about 40%, if we give it to girls only, we will decrease the prevalence in the community, but overall only by about 53 percent. And the prevalence in males will reduce, but only by about 36 percent. Whereas even with those low uptake rates, if we give it to girls and boys, we get a much greater impact and we reduce the prevalence by about 71 percent. And if we're in a higher uptake situation, for example, we've got 80 percent coverage, well then, if we go girls only, we get pretty good at about 93%, the boys still lag, but if we give both, we're getting right up there to really breaking transmission chain. So from the point of view of herd protection, it makes sense to uh, give it to both genders. But the other thing we have to think about is equity of access, and what happens if you're outside that herd? Suppose for the girls you're one of that 30% who didn't get vaccinated and you are relying on everyone else in your community being vaccinated. That's all very well and good. But our children, our young people, do not stay within the herd. My daughter has just spent the last couple of months traveling the world in places where there is no vaccination or might be very low rates of vaccination, like in France where it was about 36%. So if you want direct protection of the individual, you really need to get rates up there. What about the boys who aren't relying on interacting with the girls or gay men? They would have no protection if we keep it only as a, as a girls only program. And that is important because cervical cancer is not the only cancer uh, that uh, HPV causes. It's involved in all of these cancers here. And obviously, um, men and women, and men only here, but particularly here, the growth in the increase in head and neck cancers is a real issue of concern. And the other interesting thing is there are some differences in the biology of these viruses within the male and female population, because women tend to get it, tends to peak, and then we don't see so much of it in older years, where in men, they have higher prevalence and it tends to increase over the lifetime. And in men, they are less able, for whatever reason, to develop a good uh, antibody response to natural infection. It's poor for men and women. We get better responses after vaccine, but even poorer for men. And this data is taken from the, cancer, the Irish Cancer Registry and showing the increase in anal and rectal squamous cell carcinoma over the last years. Uh, this was uh, up to 2014, so it's a little bit old data, um, and the increase uh, was about 3 to 4 percent per year. But that's 36 cases every year, 90 percent of which are HPV-related. That's 36 families being affected by this. And in penile cancer, though there haven't been the same acceleration rate, I was surprised 
at the numbers every year. In the States, it's shown that um, cervical cancer is declining uh, related to the cervical screening program, and we still need that. That's a very important pillar of preventing cervical cancer, but also to the introduction now of the vaccine. But in the same time, there has been an alarming rise in oropharyngeal cancer, head and neck cancers. And oral HPV prevalence is significantly higher in males than in females. And here are the rates from the cancer registry here, showing the upward trend in head and neck cancers um, over time, and particularly in the solid line in men, with a 0.75% uh, increase. Now that's fine looking at graph, and that was up to 2014, but if we look at the very detailed HICWA report on this, which is online, it's a very large document, but it actually is an excellent document. What we see, oops, is um, between 2009 and 2013, there were about 123 cases per year, and that has increased to about 168 cases per year. And now we're, in some of those, we're able to definitively say, are they HPV related? And for those that have been tested in Ireland, it's estimated that anywhere up to about 40, 43%, but that represents a 37% increase. Now, in other countries, they actually estimate the rates that are HPV-related as higher, and this may be an underestimate because we don't test them all. And in the UK, um, a doubling of oropharyngeal carcinoma cases, and 50% estimated to be HPV-related. So this really is an emerging problem, and it's one that the vaccine could abort. So why boys? High rates of infection across all age groups, impacted by certain diseases and cancers, so they do need direct protection. They re remain susceptible throughout their life with low rates of seroconversion after natural infection. And there's no screening, there's no routine screening for head and neck cancer or for anal cancer. And gender neutral vaccination programs accelerates uh, HPV cancer and disease elimination, both in terms of cervical cancer for girls, but also in terms of um, the other cancers that we're seeing. And a question, and you've heard this, it really is a safe vaccine. It has been subjected to more su study and scrutiny than virtually any other uh, vaccine available. And each review comes back with the same thing. There really are no safety signals around it. And that's really the basis for HICWA's recommendations. First NIAC recommended, then it went and a HTA was obtained, and HICWA did a very thorough review looking at all the scientific evidence and then looking at cost effectiveness as well. And they recommended to the minister a change um, in the vaccine program from the four valent to the nine valent and to include boys. And what can you do, you here in the audience? Well, I'm probably going to say the same thing that you've heard at least twice today, if not more, but it really is important and the research and the evidence shows it. You are, we are so important because if you look, and this was taken from an Australian study, um, the, uh, the percentage, the influence of healthcare providers, be it the doctors or other healthcare providers, outweighs everything else. And yes, there is unfortunately, there's influence from celebrities that can be used for good or ill, Influence of politicians is very important, and that also made a big difference to us in terms of the HPV campaign, because our Minister for Health, he really did come on board, and political will, we can't underestimate it, it's very important, not only in trying to help make the resources available, but also in getting that message out there. Um, so, I just, the message, you are really important. So be informed reliable information sources. The HSE website in this is actually incredible. I still go to it all the time when I want to remind myself of time because it's factual, evidence-based information, easily accessible. And we should all provide strong, presumptive message for vaccination, present it as part of the routine, emphasize the anti-cancer message rather than myths or fears that are unfounded, focus on disease pre pre prevention, Ask parents. Parents do just want to do what's best for their children. We all do. 
ask their concerns, acknowledge their fears, advise, and if they really don't want to do it, leave the door open to come back another day or to seek more information for them. And together we can. It is too late for Laura, but we can prevent other girls going through the same thing. For those who write articles like that, I don't think Laura would have agreed. I want to acknowledge everybody who've worked with us, all of you here in the room who are the first line in dealing with the families. And um, this is one disease that we really have the tools to combat and we have to remember all the others that vaccination is so important for. Thank you.